2021 at 6 p.m. Brandon, would you please call the roll? And you'll have to unmute. You probably know that. All right. So um, I don't know if everybody's aware, but um, Michael Beardsley is no longer part of the sustainability board. So I, I just wanted to give that update. So I will not be calling his name during this. Oh, uh, and we, okay, here we go. Eric DeGroote. Pat Halquest. Here. Lisa Marone. Here. Vic Oliver. Here. And Osmond. Here. Bob Peschel. Brad Spambauer. Here. Uh, Aaron Wojciechowski. Here. Uh, Michelle Mutzel. And Margie Davey. Here. Yes, Michael had actually accepted a position outside the area, so he moved, which is why he's no longer a member of our board um, or an alternate member, as the case may be. Oh, we have seven. Yes, we do have a couple of other people are planning to come. I did um, check on that earlier. Okay, um, I believe that we have no one here for public comment. If you are, please say something now. Okay, um, the first thing on our agenda then is our approval of minutes from November 1st. Would someone like to move to accept those minutes? Move to accept. And a second, please. Second. Thank you. Um, Brandon, if you would call the roll for the minutes. Sure. Uh, so we got Pat. Pat Halquest. Pat, you're muted. If you're saying yes, you need to unmute for a second. Okay. Yeah, I knew that. Um, I was having trouble unmuting. Yeah. A. Thanks. Lisa Marone. Hi. Vic Oliver. Aye. And Osmond. Aye. Bob Peschel is not here. Brad Spambauer. Aye. Aaron Wojciechowski. Aye. We just popped on. Okay, Michelle's not here. So then, Marty. I am here. Sorry, just got on. Would you like to approve the minutes? As written. Hi. Thank you. And Margie <laughs> Davies. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> and Margie says I. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on then. The first thing on our agenda tonight is our UWO student presentation. Um, this semester they worked on urban agriculture, and I'm glad to see that Jen's here to hear what they have to say too. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Feldman, if you would like to introduce the presenters tonight. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks again, as always, for making time uh, for this. So we've got uh, just um, one presentation tonight from, from two students who will introduce themselves. Uh, I'll keep it that short and that quick and turn it over to Brian and Catherine. But thanks again, everyone, for, for your time and, and helping uh, provide a platform for the students to show their work. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm Catherine. I'm also excited to be here. So thank you very much. And then should I just jump right into it? All right. Yeah, go for it, Brian. If you want to share your screen and share your presentation, you can go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, can you see my screen right now? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. looks good. 
All right, we're all set to go then. Everyone's everything's looking good on your end. It is. Thank you. All right. Uh, so again, excited to be here. Um, we have a presentation prepared uh, for the Oshkosh Sustainability Advisory Board uh, and company. Uh, we'll be focusing on urban agriculture in Oshkosh tonight. Uh, just a brief overview. Uh, we'll talk about the current situation and some uh, barriers uh, in place. Uh, we'll think about some sustainability implications, um, what stakeholders are involved, uh, look at some examples from other cities, uh, and then end with, end with some recommendations for you. Uh, so the situation here in Oshkosh, uh, just a refresher, um, two residents, Jen and Adam Sattler, approached the SAB with uh, the desire to cultivate their one-acre property uh, into an urban orchard, and then uh, Brandon asked us to investigate this case further. Uh, so urban agriculture, uh, the property, uh, it's currently allowed. It would require a resident to obtain a conditional use permit. Uh, and then if that property were zoned residential, we would look at the home occupations regulations to further see what is and isn't allowed. Uh, so our, through our research, we identified a number of different uh, regulatory barriers in place in different cities and whatnot. Um, but today we're just going to be focusing on four of those barriers. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, the ability of on-site sales, uh, looking at public and community uses of urban farms, uh, thinking about city definitions and descriptions of the different practices, uh, and then look at conditional and special use permit application costs. Okay, so because urban agriculture is a pretty new and growing topic in the field of sustainability, we decided to look at it through the pillars of sustainability, which are economy, society, and environment. So for our presentation, we'll go through the environmental aspects, including vacant lo lots and lawns and ecosystems and providing more diversity in those and pests as well. We'll also look at the social aspects with creating a sense of community and who they will be, who will be impacted by that. And then also the economic sides with food security and food deserts. All right, so since urban agriculture has been proposed as a more <clears throat> environmentally friendly alternative to both uh, industrial agriculture and urban development, we wanted to look at those environmental impacts. Uh, and one of the major things we wanted to think about was pollinators in an urban setting. Uh, so we examined a study from Iowa City. Uh, it looked at uh, pollinator supply and demand budget. So what resources were available to uh, these pollinators in regards to urban agriculture locations. Uh, so the largest deficit was found in resource poor lawns and lots, uh, while the largest surplus were found in patches of diverse native ecosystems. Uh, and typically lawns and lots are going to be where urban agriculture sites are being developed. Uh, and then once the farm is up and running, we see uh, diverse fruits, vegetables, trees, plants. Uh, so it has the potential to uh, positively impact uh, pollinators in an urban setting. And then I believe urban beekeeping was just approved in Oshkosh. So it has um, some positive benefits there for Oshkosh as well. Uh, and then thinking about pests in urban agriculture, um, because these practices are occurring in an urban setting, uh, we want to think about the community and neighborhood impact. Uh, if we see an influx in pests and an infestation in all the gardens around an urban farm going up, that's not a very sustainable or community orientated practice. Uh, so we examined a study from Chicago. Uh, it looked at 29 different sites for brassica crop pests. Uh, brassica is just a genus of the family, uh, cabbage and mustard, so cauliflower, broccoli, some common crops. Um, the pests were cabbage worm and sap feeding aphids. Um, and over the six month period, it found that there were a diverse number of natural predators that effectively suppressed those pests. Uh, and it was insects, mostly wasp, ladybugs. Uh, so I think it just serves as a good example for how maybe there is an influx in pests, but ultimately um, these urban farms have the ability to regulate their ecosystems in a natural way. Uh, and then on to economic impacts. Um, so food production is often at the core goal of what these urban farms are about. So we wanted to think about community food production. Um, so we examined a study from Madison. Uh, it looked at productive output at uh, an estimated number of gardens in Madison. Uh, and what the study found was that uh, on a macro scale, uh, urban agriculture didn't contribute to food security uh, across the whole city. Uh, it was 
uh, more impactful on a smaller tightly knit community or neighborhoods. Um, it's also worth noting that the yield from uh, these gardens was similar or even higher compared to industrial agriculture, uh, but the land use and land cover was just significantly less for uh, those industrial agriculture. Then another impact they had in terms of economic impacts is on food deserts. So food deserts are areas that are low in high quality food and affordable food. So there was a study from Detroit, Michigan that looked at food deserts in Detroit and how urban agriculture impact was able to eliminate that. So before Farmer Jack started in 1966, there were still supermarkets in the area that had local vendors. However, they were very scattered. So Detroit was very much a food desert for most of the city, but by 2000, Farmer Jack started to be outcompeted by larger stores such as Meyer, uh, Walmart, and and Walmart and Meyer. And so then by so then by 2007, it was forced to leave. The last store was forced to shut down and close, which left the area, especially with no fresh produce. However, the town was an urban market that opened and was able to provide the community with fresh produce. As you can see in these bottom pictures, it has its own farm and it's able to have a variety of fruits and vegetables that are affordable and that the community can easily come together and have. And then the picture to the side is just an older picture of Farmer Jack. So the social impacts, this brings me to the next slide because Detroit is a population that ha is around 80% African American. So urban agriculture definitely had an impact on this community and being able to provide them fresh fruit and affordable options. And it also has an impact on other communities as well, such as Chicago, where about half the population is either African American or Hispanic. So this picture on the left shows an initiative called Wind, Windy City Harvest, which is part of Chicago Botanic Gardens, and is just an initiative to help people gain job, gain skills in urban agricultural work. And then also with social impacts, survey found that farms with goals of improving the quality of life are more likely to be located in lower income neighborhoods. So as you can see from these statistics, the, the community helping with the community and education, it was very, it was pretty successful and also with food security and also just for markets as well. So stakeholders involved, of course, Jen and Adam were the ones who basically brought up the idea of urban agriculture in Oshkosh. There are residents of Oshkosh who have their own urban orchard and they would like to grow produce and sell However, because of the current city codes, they were unable to do so. And this picture in the top right corner shows their shows their lot. And also another stakeholder we looked at were the neighbors, Justin and Jackie Averkamp. They support urban agriculture. At first, they were worried about parking. However, because Jen and Adam would be able, if Jen and Adam were able to grow and sell their produce, they would probably set, set up barriers along along the yard and also signs so that customers would know to park in their driveway. And then we've also looked at stakeholders from the farmer's market and food co-op, Michelle Schmidt, who's the manager of the farmer's market, and then Kelly Matthews, who's the second president of the Oshkosh Food Co-op. We also wanted to mention that we did try to contact John Adams, other neighbor who is against urban agriculture. However, due to sickness, we were unable to do so. All right, and then just a reminder of those uh, regulatory barriers I was talking about, because um, that brings me to my next uh, slide and how some other cities have dealt with these barriers. Um, so some examples from other cities, Appleton, Wisconsin, um, it's an example of a city that's very similar to Oshkosh geographically and in terms of city makeup population. Uh, I think it's just a great example of a city that's um, created really effective and accessible codes, uh, and it always hasn't been that way. Um, so currently retail sales of plants and produce grown on site, uh, as well as 
public use of the urban farm may occur between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, so this was from a report of the city plan commission meeting. Uh, it was then ultimately approved a few months later. Um, another thing they did in that uh, plan commission meeting was that they refined and updated definitions of urban agriculture uh, just to create a, an easier or smoother process in regulating what is and isn't allowed for the defin definitions. Um, similarly, Milwaukee did a uh, EPA initiated urban agriculture code audit where they uh, identified barriers as well, uh, two of which were sales on site and definitions. Um, but current code, uh, seasonal markets and on site sales may be allowed up to 180 days. Um, and then obviously, all these are typically through conditional and special use permits. Um, but one of the more interesting permits that we found was an urban agriculture permit specifically for agriculture. Um, and this was in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, it was about a $48 fee uh, in total. And then below this, I have uh, six different cities in Wisconsin and uh, the different costs of either a conditional or special use permit. Uh, we can see Oshkosh, Appleton, and Madison are on the higher end of the spectrum there with Green Bay, Platteville, uh, lower. So I think it just serves as a good illustration of the different levels of accessibility of getting these permits in even just a small area like Wisconsin. And then with that, similar to Appleton and Milwaukee, the recommendations we therefore have for the city are to allow for the retail sales of plants and to also allow urban agriculture entrepreneurs to grow the produce on site. We also would recommend that the hours of urban farms to be between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. every week, just like in Appleton, or limited to 880 days in a cal calendar year, unless it's specifically stipulated in the CUP. We also recommend different definitions for specific types of urban agriculture, such as cultivation or urban farms or community gardens. We recommend the city to have definitions for that to kind of organize the system maybe a little more. We also recommend a specific permit created for urban agriculture practices that have less than one acre for residential, non-residential areas. And we also recommend a full review of the costs associated with conditional use permit application process. Uh, so then in conclusion, a lot of the stuff we provided you today is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of different cities doing this, and it's not just in America, it's worldwide. Uh, we feel like this is really an exciting new alternative to food production. Um, and with some minor tweaks in Oshkosh city code, um, it could really create a uh, a progress in environmental and sustainability infrastructure. Um, it's ultimately somewhat new in the terms of the scope and scale and complexity of modern cities, so it should be continually researched, but ultimately it should be made more accessible to any residents who desire to um, cultivate their property with this purpose in mind. Um, and then we just have our references here. Uh, and then thank you very much for having and listening. Uh, we're open to any questions now. Thank you. One question I have is, are you, either of you from Oshkosh? I know you are for school, but I mean, do you live here otherwise? I'm from Horicon. It's about 45 minutes south. Yeah, I'm originally from Menominee Falls. Menominee Falls, okay. Thank you. I'm just always curious. Um, Ken. Uh, yeah, uh, I found it interesting you selected Detroit. Uh, that's where I was born and raised and uh, I have a few friends participating in urban agriculture. Were you able to study or get information on indoor urban agriculture? Uh, I, did, or? I did not exactly look into that. I just kind of looked at D-Town and also Farmer Jack and just the competitors that it was competing against. So I, I didn't look exactly into indoor urban agriculture. Okay. That's Just an example, in Detroit, they had a, uh, a factory that, that had been closed since World War II, and last I heard, they were trying to convert that to large indoor agricultural space and hydroponics. So it'd be interesting if you guys follow on to that. The other question I had was, 
do we know why the fees are so high, Oshkosh? Is that from soil testing or were you able to find that out? I was not able to find that out. That's kind of why we just recommended a review of the cost just to look at, you know, why is it so high? I don't know. The Which was interesting that the St. Paul uh, example, it was like a $18 soil test fee and that was through the University of Minnesota. So if uh, you happen to do a soil test fee, I'm sure you could go through the Eric lab on campus here. Okay. Thank you. Ken, the, uh, the, the, that $400, $450 uh, fee is, is the conditional use permit. That would apply to all conditional use permits. So within each zoning district, there are conditional uses. And if someone was to want to do one of those uses on wherever that property may be, they would have to apply for a conditional use permit and pay that fee and uh, fill out the application and go to plan commission and go through the, the process to get approved. So it's the, the four hundred fifty dollar fee isn't just for urban agriculture. Urban agriculture is a use uh, that uh, would require a conditional use permit. And paying the fee in no way guarantees that the uh, conditional use permit will be granted. Is that correct? That is correct. However, you know I think it ultimately comes down to Planning Commission and City Council to get those approvals. Does anybody else have any questions for for our wonderful team here? Well, I'm guessing you must have covered everything pretty well then. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, Ken, I see your hands up. That's just from before, right? Uh, okay. I was just wondering, yeah, I, I guess this is for the folks from the city is that, do we have any other conditional uses that have been spun off from the broader umbrella? Are there any instances of that in our city code? I mean, like uh, we have all these uses defined, but has there been a different use that's not defined that's been approved? So is that what the or question is? And put it under its own umbrella versus a general blanket. It's use. possible. You got to remember, I'm I've only been with the city for about two years, so um, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. It's something I could definitely look into and report back to the board on, or, or send you an email, Ken. Or we have city manager Mark Roloff here if he wants to chime in. Let's ask, let's ask Mark to address that. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I always enjoy, I saw this on the agenda and no one sent me an invitation, but I always like listening to these presentations. So thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm trying to remember the one exactly, but there was something that came up a few months back and I wasn't sure if it was SAB or another group, but we uh, we made a special permit fee and I'm guessing that's probably what St. Paul did because I the the I don't know everybody's special or conditional use permits, but the ones you cited are probably as uh, Brian pointed out, they're basic conditional use permits. Uh, it, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember which one it was, but we reduced the fee specifically, so we isolated a specific fee, so it's not unprecedented. Ken, to your question, can we do it? Yeah, it's just a matter of uh, identifying the area. So my my question was when you were looking at Appleton, for example, I know they converted a, a former area into a, a public garden. It's uh, it's it's along the river near South Oneida Street. I, it's, I'm, the name's escaping me. Is that the only area that they permitted urban gardening? Because I know they're doing a, a heavy dose of urban gardening in that area, but I don't know if they opened it up to other parts of the city, but you know, we could do Is a special the fee. Terrace, Mark? River, yeah, that's it. Yeah, River, okay. River yeah. yeah, yeah, Riverview Terrace. Um, oh, it was an old golf course, wasn't it? Uh, that they converted, and part of it's urban gardens. Uh, was that the? Do you know if they did anywhere else? Uh, um, I, I tried contacting a few different urban farms in uh, Appleton, but uh, I didn't get in touch with them. So I, I think there's other urban farms there, but I don't know if they would be zoned residential or not. Yeah. One of the advantages of taking it out of conditional use, a few years ago, the state, um, it was sort of a, a pro-development process. They took away, or they, they took away the ability of cities to limit conditional uses. And if there were reasonable restrictions placed on a conditional use, we're now required to approve the conditional use rather than 
have a little more discretion. Putting it into its own category would probably help us uh, if we took it out of the conditional use category. But again, I'm my silence was really more about following up with staff and saying, okay, what do you guys think? You know, what what things could we do? Because I know urban agriculture, the SAB's taken a strong stand with uh, doing the uh, urban chickens, which the world did not end um, when we did it. And we we loosened it up a little bit. And then we did the urban bees. And I've had people, no pun intended, well, maybe pun intended, buzzing in my ear about the, the value of urban beekeeping. So is this something we can look at? I don't see why not. It's really just a matter of making it right. Probably doing a little digger deep uh, dive into um, what, uh, what Brian and Catherine have done here so far. So I, uh, that's, I'll certainly talk to staff about uh, what we can do follow-up wise. Uh, it isn't for every place in the city, but there are certain areas where I think it could be compatible or maybe not Thank incompatible. You, hey, Brad, do you have something to share? Yeah, I was just going to add, I think the thing that we're all thinking about was the solar, right? Solar was taken out of the conditional use permit and now that was it done. Thanks, Brad. Good separately. catch. Yeah. So it seems like perhaps um, there, you know, is, is some push here to move urban agriculture um, under probably a, a specific set of, um, you know, definitions and guidelines into its own permitting system um, that, would, that would be a little bit lower than, than a typical CUP. Does anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to share? Ken? Okay, your hand was just up from before. Okay, then. Well, we would like to thank our presenters. We would like to thank Dr. Feldman for once again bringing us uh, some information that we, we really appreciate, as you know. And um, we'll see Can you I, next semester. I yeah, think. I just wanted to say thank you. And at some point, I um, the uh, full senior seminar will be, uh, the course will be run again next semester. So if you have a chance to identify uh, any projects or questions that you'd like the the students to investigate next semester? Um, that would be that would be great. Um, we we enjoy responding to the things that you're you're looking for information on too. So it's a good so collaboration. Have, yeah. Yep. Well, thanks everybody. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll also be submitting a like a more in-depth report on the presentation we just gave. So hopefully that'll be even better for you guys starting to make the changes or, you know, just decide what you decide. Great. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Just get that over to get, get that over to Jim or when you guys are all finished with, then I'll get it online for you guys. Yeah, the, the, they'll get it to me as the dust of the semester settles and I'll and I'll get it over to Brandon for sure and to Marky. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, that, that was fun. Um, now, moving on, our next thing on the agenda is the Environmental Leadership Award. You may remember this from previous years. Um, in fact, I believe we have one of our former um, honorees present tonight. Hmm. <laughs> the Environmental Leadership Award is something that the Sustainability Board does in collaboration with the Oshkosh West Rotary Environmental and Beautification Committee. Whew, that's a long one. And uh, we ask for nominations from the public, from our board, from Rotary, um, from any citizen actually who has. Um, one of the criteria that we look for, well, there's actually five and an honoree would have to meet at least one of these environmental activism within the city of Oshkosh, leadership contribution, development of an innovative or model program or facility, whether it's in use or just being planned, leading or fostering a long term initiative, making a substantial contribution to environmental protection or removal of environmental hazards and leadership influential in achieving a documented substantial improvement in quality of the environment. Now, 
I'm sure you're all going to be able to repeat those back to me. So actually, we're going to ask Brandon if we could please put this up on the Facebook page, maybe that um, the five criteria and the we don't actually have an application form. We just ask for submissions and there are some rules like um, what we would what we need you to tell us the summary and how many words and things like that. So um, if anybody on our board would like to submit nominations, you may do that. The nominations will be closing um, on January 20th, and then the award is made at the State of the City in March. So if you have anybody in mind, now might be a good time to go ahead and um, submit that so that can be reviewed. Does anybody have anything to add on that? Ken does. Go ahead, Ken. Well, I'm feeling a little embarrassed that I hadn't thought of this organization as a potential recipient of this, but I didn't wasn't quite sure the criteria is related to people versus organizations. Mm. Um, okay, yes, it can be I a say, person or an organization. Should I say um, my thoughts on a potential nominee? Well, you might you might want to just wait and, and put it in writing and submit it as an application, you know. Okay. For the review team, and so as not to um, spoil any surprises. I, maybe uh, you covered this. So I'm sorry if I missed it. Our nomination process. Where? How do we do that? Um, Brandon's going to put it up on Facebook for, right, Brandon. Um, for the information that you need, the nominations have to include the name and and contact info for both the nominee and the nominator. And a brief less than 500 word summary of the contributions that the nominee has made to the environment. So that could be the organization or a person. And if you find it beneficial, you could also offer 3 letters of support or exhibits. Um, that's not required. I'm pretty sure um, the nomination I made um, a year and a half or so ago. I didn't have any letters of support. I just wrote my observations and, and that did it. So, and I see someone else has their hand up. Oh, Pat, okay. You were kind of spinning on my screen and I couldn't see who it was. I should ask first, Ken, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And okay, I'll, Pat. And the, the, uh, the, in the meeting packet for tonight, um, I believe that sheet is in the meeting packet for tonight. If uh, it should be in that email that you received a link to it. Oh, yes, it's item one or something. Yeah. So that's that's what I'll be putting on the Facebook page, right, Margie? Right. And um, well, most of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Pat, I see you and I see your hand. I don't see you, but I see your hand up that there's this funny little triangle. Can are you say something so we know if you we can hear you? Is anybody else hearing her? No, and she's not okay. muted either, so she must be having technical difficulty. Yeah. Pat, I would suggest that maybe you might want to log off and log back in, and we'll see. Yep, then, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, but we just aren't hearing you. Does anybody else have any thoughts or ideas that you want to share on this particular item? We can come back to it for Pat later, um, if need be. Okay, well then, since that one required no action, I am going to move on to the next um, item, which is our main discussion for the evening. Ah, oh, I see Pat's back. Pat, can you hear me now? Hello, Pat. Don't you just love being online this way, folks? Mm -hmm. All be safe, but we can hear each other when we're in person, I just have to say. Okay. Then I'm going to move on again. Okay, so we were going to discuss our past UWO student projects. Um, there were several of them, many of them, and 
often we get the reports like we did tonight and we go, wow, that's really cool. And then we, we kind of just put them on the back burner and, and don't get back to them. So what we had talked about doing last month was to just review the ones that we've had since, um, well, since we began in spring of 18 with this, that since we had them online. So I'm going to go through the ones from spring 21, which was just last semester. Um, quickly, and if there is anything on here that you would like to address or that you think we should look at for putting on our goal list for 2022, which I can't believe I'm even saying that. Did you know it's almost 2022? Wow. Um, seems like we just, you know, switched to the new century. Anyway, um, spring 21, we had e-waste collection event that was discussed. Uh, Okay, I don't see anybody with real interest in that, but you can always jump in again later if you want to. Um, the residential pervious event, and I did notice that several of our groups in the past have um, dealt with pervious pavement, so that might be a bigger um, or could be more encompassing than what we had in, in spring of 21. There was the restaurant composting that both Brandon were stakeholders in the report. So um, I know you're very aware of that. Oh, and by the way, Brad was for the e-waste collection event also. And um, then Brad and Michelle were both stakeholders when we talked about road salt. And actually we did get some questions answered pretty well on that from Mr. Robbie at the time. Okay, was there anything there that anybody's feeling an urgent need to deal with? Brad. Um, you know, not necessarily an, an urgent, uh, need. I mean, my, I guess my question in all of these, you know, each of these are things that I, um, address and deal with in my role as campus sustainability director for the university. Um, you know, we hold an e-waste collection event every spring. Um, you know, we've, we've certainly discussed, uh, previous pavement. Alternatives, as I know, we've kind of discussed as a board, um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, it's it's kind of up to Brian Langolf, the biogas program manager and I to kind of get back into the swing of things of discussing, um, you know, talking with with restaurants or others who are interested in getting their food waste to the biodigester. And then we, we have implemented um, a, a, a salt alternative, basically a salt extender um, that will help reduce our, our use of salt. My my question is, um, what what I guess is the pathway for us to make some meaningful progress or action on any of these items as an SAB? So, for example, if we wanted to, if we wanted to circle back to addressing, you know, road salt alternatives with with staff at the city um and and kind of diving deeper into that like what does that look like well to my mind that would mean that we would potentially do more research on it or review the research that the students have already given us and then talk to the different people at the city to see if there are ways that um providing this information to them might help if they are aware of it if they have more questions they'd like us to research more um and ultimately with some of them i don't know if road, road salt would actually be a good example for this but um for example with the urban agriculture um to actually go ahead and propose a change to whatever our current code or of whatever resolution is so or ordinance so that um some change could actually happen because that would be really nice to actually have some things happen. And my concern in going through all of this was that I wanted to be sure that we did forget about any of this that we've had in the past. Um, I am see hands flying up all over the place. So I'm guessing others have different thoughts on this. I'm going to start with you, Ken. Um, well, I was kind of wondering, you know, what the next steps are sort of thing. There's obviously two on here that we're a local business or two hint, hint uh, could serve as a guinea pig to help 
with the research, and I, I'm Brad, I'm remiss because of COVID and the last chaos of the last two years and actually meeting up with you. But I'm wondering is the next steps sort of look like, you know, just taking a, someone through that process, seeing what barriers exist, and then addressing each of those items one by one with the city? Is does is that what that looks like? I guess I'm Sorry, asking everybody. Too. Oh yeah. I mean I think, you know, I think in terms of the um the the composting situation i mean yes to, to me that is a that is a, a conversation to have between the the biogas program at the university and you know whatever um business owner want, wants to have their food waste um you know you know collected i mean i i think the um i think the sab can have a hand in that or or it um can just sort of be supported by it um you know kind of tangentially um uh, yeah i mean i think for i think for uh, several of these the 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 method is going to be a little different i guess what i was mostly getting at was um are these things that are are going to require a subcommittee um and or should we choose a couple of them and plan to attend other necessary um board meetings or, you know, sort of like if there's something that is directly related to, you know, the street department, like, is there a way to meet with them as a group um, and, and kind of just better have a, a session where everybody gets on the same page and then we discuss the direction for which, you know, more information needs to be gathered. Yeah, because okay, I, I think, think I'd point like to hear taken. some thoughts from Michelle and Vic, please. Oh, sorry. Um, and then we'll see if everybody's um, they, they may have some thoughts that are relevant here. Michelle, why don't you go ahead? I know um, we had updates from the city before, as they said, you know, we've been doing a lot of progress on this. Um, and I don't remember if we actually got to see um, data about salt i don't think they were able to give us any information about or you know give us much data about um here's the salinity of you know lake winnebago from this time to this time to get you know kind of a idea of if it's gotten worse over time obviously it would but just the rate and everything and um i i think it'd be a good idea to be able to figure out where we want to go like what the, what is the goal um, where are we currently at and, you know, partner with the university to possibly do something um, with that? Because obviously water testing is available through the university. Um, and I don't know if that means also looking for a grant city city wise to be able to afford that or if it's just a university partnership. But um, just an idea I had with that because I feel like if we're going to suggest an action, we should also have an idea of a goal of where we want to go and where we want to be at or stay under, you know. Well, that's kind of the whole point of discussing which ones we wanted to, to work on to get to that point, right? It was what I was thinking. Um, Vic, what were you thinking? Yeah, so I was just going to share, um, so like previous example, for those of us who were on the board in 2017, I believe if my math is correct, um, there was a student presentation on a vehicle idling ordinance similar to what happens in Madison and Eau Claire. And a couple of us took it on, kind of did like a subcommittee type situation, um, discussed how far we wanted to take it, what the expectations in reality would be in Oshkosh, and just kind of made determination amongst us um, that we would just really do this as an educational moment and wouldn't really push for any sort of ordinance in the city. So I wrote a letter that was actually sent out with all Oshkosh Area School District students for that year about the um, side effects, so to speak, of vehicle idling, especially near school zones. So it really just depends how far the personal SAB stakeholder wants to take it. So you really get to make it your own based on how passionate and the time and resources you personally have and what the rest of the SAB board is willing to invest. So I just feel like it can be frustrating at times. You're like, well, what's our next step? But really, it's what you want to do with it. So like for this one, 
for the vehicle idling, we were like, nope, an educational letter, that'll be fine. We'll just kind of call that one done. But if this is something we really okay, want to work we're, we're out. In, okay. I got it on the phone. <laughs> if this is something we really want to go for, it's it's up to us to really to really take that stance. There isn't really no lot, no. There is no there are three defined limits. Next step, so speak. Yes, thank you. I'm done. And, and in that case, we did choose to to do with it and end there because of some of the um, feedback that we got from from our efforts. Um, we had originally discussed maybe asking all the banks and and drive throughs to put up um, and fast food restaurant drive throughs to put up little signs saying, you know, please don't idle, but um, concluded that that maybe wasn't a step that was that we were ready for here. Um, okay, we do have somebody else here, Lisa. So I was thinking for each of these topics, let's say, for example, like the solar panels, we went all the way to the Oshkosh City Council to try and get that um, zoning price conditional formatting taken down. So I think it depends, like, are we, we should maybe break it down, like, does the salt need to become an ordinance or do we need to change an ordinance, like the urban agriculture? Or is this just a project, like Vic said, where you can send out a letter to residents? Um, so I think maybe that could be helpful if we like broke it down based on how far you want to go within the city. If it's something that needs to be on their agenda, um, or if it's something that the SAB board can do on their own. Exactly, and we need to decide which of I mean to be able to do all. 300 of these that we have, okay, 25 of them that we have um, in one year, probably. But I was hoping that we could state which ones we were interested in to work on in the upcoming year. And then each person that wanted to work with that could put their efforts towards that. I mean, it kind of sounds like um, Brad and Ken might be interested in working together on something for the restaurant composting. So they, the two of them could do that. I know one question that constantly comes up and we haven't um, been able to have the city attorney explain this to us as a group yet, although we're trying for that, I think in February, but we do need to be sure we understand the rules of walking quorums and how many of us can meet. And I mean, any two of us can meet and discuss something. If we add a third person, then it becomes a subcommittee and we can still meet we just need to have it noticed to the public and that's because of transparency laws. So we just want to be sure that we're in um, compliance with, with the city's rules while we work on different things, but it doesn't mean that we can't get together. And I mean, we can all get together another time if we want, we just have to notice it, um, which is probably no help at all for you, but for somebody from the, um, legal department will just probably explain that much better than I can. Um, I'm going to go back to Ken and Brad who were Ma both Margie? having some thoughts. I'm Margie? Start. Yeah. Margie, can you hear me? Pat. I, I oh, lost yes. my internet I can. completely. You can't raise so your hand. I, I get it. I can't raise my hand, so I I don't need to be called on right now, but will you call on me later? <laughs> and I missed part of the I discussion, will. so I don't know what you've said <laughs> so far. Okay. Okay, thanks, Pat. <laughs> okay, let's go with Ken then. Um, I like somebody just said something before I start because it almost seems like this list would be really great against in a spreadsheet where you kind of identify what's an R and research and development where we have to dive deeper or use case. Then there's a category of potential ordinance change and another one would be potentially education. Like to kind of identify the pathways of each of these items, like what's their landing point, you know, and so that and the reason why I'm thinking that way is the two that I'm most interested in are, of course, restaurant composting and single use plastic reduction. Those in my mind, I think to. Um, uh, I think it was Michelle said it or, or Lisa. I'm sorry if I don't remember right. But those are something where it's like a informational development use case, and then it becomes a, an objective for education for the SAB, unless an ordinance issue is discovered in that use case development. 
Is that thinking sound logical? Where a couple of us could spearhead those two things, document them. If anything needs to be brought back to the SAB in terms of collaborating with the city, but then also how do we promote this? As a participation educational. Does that sound right? That's exactly the point of this this exercise tonight. Ken. usually in January, we like to create okay. a, uh, an overview for the upcoming year. And I know about the time you came on board, we started having this little issue where we weren't really meeting him together and stuff. So okay. we hadn't been through the process the way it had been okay. done in past yeah, years. Work, honey. The whole idea is to create, um, I don't know if I'd call it a matrix or a spreadsheet. Can you turn off? And say where we are with the different things, but we need to identify which items we should put on there. Because if there's no interest at all in one of these, well, then we should just not bother with it. Um, so that's kind of what I'm attempting to do tonight. So thank you. I just got two things from you, Ken, and, and you went all the way down to um, fall of 19 already. So good. <laughs> um, Brad, did you have something? That yeah, I just wanted to have we had um, Wisconsin Saltwise give a presentation before? Does anyone recall I that? I believe we did a bunch of years ago, but not not recently. Maybe, but I know I I attended the Saltwise presentation and then I kind of reported on that afterwards this year. Okay. So I'd be interested in working on the kind of road salt initiative, whether that's reduction or alternatives or whatever. Um, my my thought was we we just held our UW system sustainability uh, annual meeting, and one of the sessions there was the salt wise presentation, which was very very good. Um, I, I wonder could we could we make um, possibly the first portion of the January meeting or perhaps the February meeting um, a presentation by salt wise, and would we be able to include uh, relevant members of the city um, and then and then perhaps also um, I could include Lisa Mick who is the grounds director for the university and she could perhaps talk about the efficacy of um, the the kind of salt extender that the university will now be using to reduce its salt usage. Would that be a good first step? We could make all of those things happen, Brad. All right, so put me down for spearheading salt reduction alternatives. Okay, I, I actually have you and Michelle down for that. Is that still okay with you, Michelle? One thing I have found is if, if we can work in teams on this, um, we kind of help to goad each other into getting it done. So not that you need any goading, Brad. I know that. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to go to Pat next. Um, a little bit of follow up of what Ken said, but some and I didn't look at every single student report, but I tried to do a pretty quick scan and kind of make a guess as to which ones did involve code changes. And um, the three reports related to permeable pavers all in involved code reports and there wasn't, you know, it was almost, it was, I think one of them in particular, I don't remember which year, it wasn't a matter of educating the public. It was a matter of people weren't allowed to use permeable pavers on their private property, um, their driveways or something. I'm not sure exactly. And so it was like the city prohibiting something. Um, so there's not, there's not an education part to it. It's just a matter of whether you want to change the code or not. And then um, there exactly. were like three so related to landscaping. To there were three related to landscaping and in the one with native landscaping, again, it was a matter of clarifying the code. It wasn't a matter of like educating people to plant more native plants. It was like the current code actually actively discourages people from doing that. And um, unless the code is clarified, you know, it's like a barrier to people doing that. And um, I think in, in uh, you know several of these reports um 
you know, if you don't change the code, it doesn't make any sense to educate people because the code discourages them from doing it. You know what I'm saying? And I think some of those would be pretty low hanging fruit in terms of changing because changing, you know, changing the code because um, the students did a lot of the work and actually proposed wording and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think the idea of figuring out which ones are education issues and which ones are code changes and then maybe trying to um, and I'm not sure I missed the big part of the meeting, so I'm not sure what you asked people to comment on, but, um, but I, th I think identifying the ones that involve code changes and, and trying to figure out if those code changes would be possible. I think some of that could be done pretty quickly. You know, so what I think you're proposing I, is. Um, group, perhaps working on. Code changes, just as we identify which of these are code changes, that could be one category rather than having somebody work right. on previous payment and somebody on landscaping and all, which makes a lot of sense. And I did notice that too as I was reading through them. And first time ever, I did read through them all today, and it took most of the day. So I'm not surprised we didn't all make it through all of them. Yeah, um, but Pat, and, I just and wanted it's to ask that... you too. I know when you got cut off previously. We were discussing uh -huh. the Environmental Leadership Award. Had you had uh -huh. a, a thought on that? Uh, in terms of what the guideline? Oh, oh, it was just um, the guidelines were the guidelines and description of it were in the meeting materials. I mean, it's good for Brandon oh, to yes, post on yes. Facebook and advertise it to people. But if right. Ken wants to see it, it was in the meeting materials. Or if anybody wants to see it, it was in the meeting materials. But I think Brandon right. was pointing that you out when I there. got cut off. <laughs> well, by putting it on Facebook, it also allows the public to be able to view it more easily because it's not always right. Easy no, to no, find there's nothing wrong with the Facebook, but just people people yeah. attending the meeting today. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the native landscaping one, and I th I think you know I guess I would like to see that pushed ahead so that. Um, you know, people this summer when they're planting, planting, they know what they're allowed to do without worrying about it, having to mow it down. Okay. You know? So the way the ordinance is written now, it, it, it leads open to the possibility that a neighbor could complain about your native um, flowers. <laughs> You'd have to mow them down to eight inches. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it's, it's not a clear, the way this city ordinance is written right now, it's not very clear and it, I think it would make people reluctant. I heard of, of a of um, one group in town where somebody where somebody was working with them on native plants, then they came back and said, "Ah, we think there's too many city rules against this. We don't want to risk it." You know. So I don't think that's what we Just want, right? <laughs> you know. Exactly. Yeah. You, know, you know, and, and okay. of course. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I see Ken has his hand up again. Ken, did you have something else to share? Actually, no, I, I, I was un, un, uh, lowering my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. <laughs> Just didn't want to miss anything important there. Um, okay, well, so what I have for the spring of 21 stuff is that we think that the, um, well, just a quick recap, Brad says that UWO does an e-waste collection event in the spring which means that if we were to sponsor one from the city, we'd probably want to do it in a different time of year, like maybe the fall. Um, we all seem to agree that things like pervious pavement and native landscaping might be code change issues. And Ken would like to work on restaurant composting. Brad would like to work on road salt along with Michelle. Um, so we've got that all down for our little matrix for January. Um, then we have fall of like 20, which was when Lisa too. was, who said what? My apologies, Ken? Margie. Uh, 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 single use plastic was another one I was interested in. Oh, yes, I know that was down in fall of 19. I'm, I'm kind of taking them chronologically. I'll get there. Sorry. Um, in, in fall of 20, Lisa had worked on the sustainable Oshkosh web page with her group of um, when she was still a student. And now that she's a member of our board, I just was curious, Lisa, if you had ever 
um, gone back and looked at the web page and um, checked to be sure that the changes that had been suggested had happened. I haven't looked recently, but I would be willing to take that on and work with Brandon. I know it was an IT issue that we discussed about um, them having time to look at it, but I would definitely be able to go and make sure that everything's up to date. That would be awesome. I'm putting you down for that, and that should be relatively painless since you've been there before, right? Um, in fall of 19, we had the farm to school report and we had municipal solar. Um, and at that time, it was identified that City Hall, the police department and the wastewater treatment plant on Campbell Road would all be potential municipal sites that could benefit from solar. Um, since we have been discussing solar a lot lately, I didn't know if anybody would be interested in um, going back, reviewing that, seeing how we bring it up to date and making a proposal. If anybody is, just let us know. Um, also, we had in the fall of 19, we had the native landscaping, which Pat has already um, said that she'd like to work on on revising that code for clarity, which it desperately needs. And Ken has said he wants to work on the single use plastic reduction. Um, I think Ken with that, we had also discussed having a tour of Tri-County Recycling. And I just want to let you know that I am still working on that um, because they hadn't been allowing it for quite some time. Um, but I did get a notice that there's somebody um, new that's organizing those things now. So I need to get back to her and we'll see what we can do about that. I'm still very interested in that and I think you are too. Okay, Michelle. Oh, apparently I wasn't muted. Just okay. So I didn't have I don't have to unmute. Um I just wanted to note I thought I was already on it, but um I would like to um help Pat um on the um native plants of course because you know that's kind of my jam. Yeah. Um, yeah. it's something that I've had. Yes, and I did so. actually have you written down on that and you're still working on a okay. brochure too, right? Yes. Brochure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I wanted to just mention in fall of 18, um, and in spring of 18, all the, all the all the reports that the students gave us in those semesters were all based on the green tier. Um, it's sort of a matrix too that you kind of look at and it says it asks a lot of questions and we had the students go into our codes and and look to see if those questions were answered appropriately in our in our zoning and and other codes. So all of that is going to fall under the code change, I believe. Um, it touched on green, green green infrastructure, and that was one thing that I know that the students felt that um, the language needed changed in both planning and zoning ordinance to encourage green infrastructure. Often it's just not mentioned, which means that you don't know if it's banned or not, so it should be mentioned. Um, there were landscaping audits and recommendations that were done. Some of that referred to permeable materials also. Um, at the time, we were very concerned about the PAHs, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which appear in, which occur in, in asphalt. And we had asked about that and hadn't really been satisfied with the answers we got. So maybe we want to follow up with that. Um, and in spring of 18, it was very much the same thing. It was um, landscaping in different areas, you know, whether it was, it, it was all based on stormwater though, the landscaping to help the native plants and rain gardens would help protect our water resources and reduce runoff and prevent flooding. Well, these are all things we've been dealing with like forever, but we did have the reports from the students at those points along with kind of, I guess you could call green tier a scorecard. Um, so all of that is contained in those reports. So just a reminder for all of us that we can go back and find those uh, and use that information. Um, 
Okay, that was kind of my overview of this. Does anybody have anything they would like to add or speak up for that has it, you know, and we can have more than two people work on something. It just changes our procedures a little bit. Oh, okay, hearing nothing from anyone. I'm going to move on. Okay. Next on the agenda is the Menominee Shoreland Restoration Update, which we will give to Michelle. Yeah, so um, I did meet with the um, some of the leaders of the group. Uh, I don't remember if that was before or after our, our most recent, recent SAB meeting. I think it was after. Um, and we still have to schedule another follow-up from that because there's a lot to kind of bring together as uh, this next year is kind of our 10th year of um, when ground's already been broken, kind of a first full season of um, doing the shoreland restoration stuff. Um, but I had heard from uh, UW Oshkosh and uh, their Quest program. You know, we've partnered as a sustainability advisory board um, with UW Oshkosh before with their um, USP projects. And um, one class is actually looking to work on um, sustainability in the environment and things like uh, geography and um, the Friends of Nine Park Shoreland work would actually kind of mesh with that. So um, I'm working to with the professor to come up with um, a few projects that we could do with that. Um, and some of them actually might be brochures. Um, that is something that I mentioned um, as a potential project. So that could kind of help both the Friends of Nine Park Shoreland and the Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, so lots of exciting things to come um, just with all those different um, changes in the holidays. I haven't gotten back to um, the leadership group, but um, we'll have to meet pretty soon so I can put something together. Um, because early this next year, I'll be meeting with the um, parks board likely to uh, talk about what we're hoping to do. Excellent. And yes, I think it was three days after our last meeting that you had the, our last SAP meeting that you had your meeting. Yes. Thanks. Um, okay. Well, that brings us to our agenda items for future meetings. We had had one suggestion from Brad about the Wisconsin Salt Wise presentation. So uh, I can't promise that will happen in January, but it is potential for that. Um, we will want to review our goal sheet, which we can now put together for um, 2022. And that think is going to be sort of what you're talking about as far as it'll, it'll be a form that we can all see concretely that this is what we have, this is what we need to do, this is who's doing it, and this is what we're recommending. And um, Brad and I will work with you on that. Don't think you have to do that all alone. Um, Brad. Do you want me to reach out to Allison from Wisconsin Saltwise and see if she is willing or available for either our January meeting or our February meeting and just see if we can get one of those on the books. I think that would be appropriate. Um, do the rest of you agree? Is this something that we want to to hear? If yes. anybody doesn't want to hear it, you should say it now. <laughs> okay, yeah, Brad, that's a great idea. Um, I believe in February we we'll probably be able to have our um, our discussion with the legal department, which will be able to us clarify how we're supposed to be working as a board and um, kind of define some of the things like walking forum that, you know, there are questions that come up about, can we meet this way or that way? Um, so that's, we've got down for February unless something pushes it back. So. If we had salt wise and goal sheet in January. Okay. Yeah. And that then, would probably be good. And then what would be the proper pathway for, um, I guess, alerting, informing, or inviting 
uh, for example, like members of the, you know, folks who work on city streets. Sorry, Brad, can you say it again? Sure. Who, what would be the, the proper pathway for ensuring the folks who are in like the, the public works department to attend that meeting to see the presentation and be a part of a discussion? Okay, well, we can never make any guarantees, but Brent, really make sure that they're aware of it and that they are invited. And I can follow up with them also just to, you know, see if we're going, if we should be waiting for anybody that evening or something, sort of like I do with you guys. Um, so we, we can never guarantee, but we can certainly invite. So, and we'll let Brandon do that for us. Yeah, I just think the, you know, the discussion will certainly be much more fruitful if there's other folks who would actually implement changes, you know, present, present to, to kind of hear what needs to be said. I totally agree. Our priorities are not always the same and we're after hours, um, after work hours. So they sort of come at their own pleasure, but often they do attend and we really appreciate it. So. Okay, does anybody have anything else they would like us to put on our next or on a future meeting? Okay, I guess just um, look at that goal sheet next month and, and take it from there. I think that's going to be a jump start for a whole bunch of good stuff, don't you? Okay, with the, well, with the goal sheet, um, do you want me to send out the most updated version to everybody maybe? Um, yeah, we'll include that with the agenda, I think, when we. Okay, based on tonight's discussion. Yeah, that's if everybody... what I think. Maybe... Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just thinking if if you want me to send it, um, I guess if I'm, if anybody wants a copy, you know, a little bit earlier, maybe just shoot me an email and I can get you a copy. Are you talking about the one? The one we've had in progress forever and just adding yeah. these updates to it so that nothing drops off the radar yeah yeah okay yeah that sounds good yeah whenever you get to it i i know it's going to be a busy kind of you know few weeks here but we'll see for other reasons <laughs> it has been oddly busy so um we'll see yeah, why do people need permits in the middle of December anyway? I mean, really. <laughs> Not supposed to be busy right now. <laughs> this is exactly. supposed to be SAB time. <laughs> um, okay, well then if no one else has anything to add for this evening, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Um, oh, wait. No, Brandon has to call the roll. Yep. Last time for the night. Okay. We'll start with, is Pat still with us? Yes, we'll start with Pat. Hey. Lisa? Aye. Vic? Aye. Ken? Aye. Brad? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And Margie? Aye. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Have a nice holiday. We'll Howdy. see you next year. <laughs>